This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. A top United Nations official in New York has resigned and accused the United Nations of failing to address what he calls a textbook case of genocide unfolding in Gaza. Craig McIver is a longtime international human rights lawyer who served as director of the New York office of the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights. He'd worked at the United Nations since 1992 and lived in Gaza in the 1990s. In a letter addressed to the U.N. High Commissioner for Human Rights, Volker Turk, Craig McIver wrote, In Gaza, Civilian homes, schools, churches, mosques and medical institutions are wantonly attacked as thousands of civilians are massacred. In the West Bank, including occupied Jerusalem, homes are seized and reassigned based entirely on race, and violent settler pogroms are accompanied by Israeli military units. Across the land, apartheid rules. Craig McIver went on to write, What's more, the governments of the United States, the United Kingdom and much of Europe are wholly complicit in the horrific assault. Not only are these governments refusing to meet their treaty obligations to ensure respect for the Geneva Conventions, but they're, in fact, actively arming the assault, providing economic and intelligence support, and giving political and diplomatic cover for Israel's atrocities." Unquote. On Tuesday, the U.N. released a statement about McIver's resignation, saying, quote, I can confirm he's retiring today. He informed the U.N. in March of his upcoming retirement, which takes effect tomorrow. The views in his letter made public today are his personal views, the U.N. said. Craig McIver joins us now in New York, the first day he's not working for the United Nations. Welcome to Democracy Now! Thank you, Amy. Good to be here. So talk about why you left. Well, I originally registered my concerns in writing to the High Commissioner in March, as you heard from that uh, statement, in the wake of a wave of human rights violations on the West Bank, including the pogrom in Hawara uh, at that time. And at that time, I complained, really, about what I saw as a trepidatious response by many in the United Nations and an effort to try to silence some of the human rights critique of UN officials, including myself. Uh, and uh, you know, I, I admit to feeling a great deal of frustration and, at that moment, uh, indicating that I would be uh, resigning from the U.N. Uh, um, effective this month. So, of course, the situation got much worse since then, which is why I was, uh, particularly the events in Gaza, which is why I was compelled to write this latest letter to the High Commissioner to put on record my very serious concerns uh, about how we were failing to address the unfolding events in the occupied territories. What do you think the United Nations, the United States, the West, UK, should be doing right now? Well, I think there is an obligation on the part of all member states of the United Nations, including those states in the West, to respond uh, in accordance with their obligations under international law, including international humanitarian law. My central point in the most recent letter was that we had effectively left international law behind when uh, the international community embraced the Oslo process, which uh, sort of raised up notions of political expediency above the requirements of international law. And that was a real loss uh, for uh, human rights in, in, in Palestine. I think there is an obligation on the part of all states, not just to respect international humanitarian law and international human rights law, but under the Geneva Conventions to ensure respect. And it's clear that many states, including the United States itself, have not only uh, are not only in breach of their obligation to ensure respect vis-a-vis -vis those states over which they have influence, in this case Israel, but have been actively complicit, actively engaged in arming and diplomatic cover, uh, in political support, intelligence support, and so on. That is a breach of international humanitarian law. We need the opposite of that. We need all states, uh, members of the United Nations, to use whatever influence they have to ensure an end to these attacks on civilians in Gaza to ensure, as well, accountability for the perpetrators, redress for the victims, protection for the vulnerable there. It's interesting, Amy, we have a formula at the United Nations that is applied to virtually every other conflict situation. But when it comes to the situation in Israel and Palestine, there's a different set of rules, apparently. And that's, a, I think, a big source of my frustration. Where is the transitional justice process? Where is the UN Protection Force to protect 
all civilians? Where uh, is the tribunal for um, accountability? Where is the action on the part of the Security Council, the only mechanism in the United Nations that has enforcement to ensure protection in the occupied territories? Obviously, every effort in the Security Council is vetoed by the United States uh, itself, and further indication of the kind of complicity about which I, uh, I am referring. And I think the other thing that needs to happen in the international community is that we have to abandon the failed paradigms of the past uh, on a political level and get back to the roots, which is international law, international human rights. What has happened in the context of the so-called Oslo process, the two-state solution, the UN quartet, is that they have acted effectively as a smokescreen behind which we have seen further and worsening dispossession of Palestinians, uh, massive atrocities such as those as we are witnessing uh, now, the loss of homes and land, further settlement activity. Uh, you know, it's an open secret inside the halls of the United Nations that the so-called two-state solution is effectively impossible now. There's nothing left for uh, a sustainable state for the Palestinian people and takes no account of the fundamental human rights of the Palestinian people. The new paradigm has to be one based upon equality of all people there, uh, equal rights for Christians, Muslims, and Jews, and that needs to be the new approach. And I think as well, uh, you know, it's interesting that this year we are commemorating the 75th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights adopted in 1948. That same year, the Nakba occurred in Palestine and apartheid was adopted in South Africa. Uh, we have seen, because of a consistent international law and international human rights approach in the UN and the international community, that apartheid in South Africa uh, uh, fell. We did not take the same approach in Palestine. We've deferred to these political processes, and as a result, not only have we not seen an end to the oppression of the Palestinian people, we've seen a continuing worsening of the situation. So you're a longtime human rights lawyer. Um, I want you to respond. I played this already for use of Hamash um, uh, in Gaza right now, in Khan Yunus, uh, to respond. But I'd like you to respond to it as well. Um, after Israel's attack on Jabalia yesterday, the IDF spokesperson, Israeli Defense Force spokesperson, Lieutenant Colonel Richard Hecht, appeared on CNN and was interviewed by Wolf Blitzer. But you know that there are a lot of refugees, a lot of innocent civilians, men, women, and children in that refugee camp as well, right? This is the tragedy of war, Wolf. I mean, we, as you know, we've been saying for days, move south. Civilians are not involved with Hamas. Please move south. Yeah, I'm just uh, trying to get a little we, bit more information. Uh, you knew there were civilians there. You knew there were refugees, all sorts of refugees. But you decided to still drop a bomb on that refugee camp, attempting to kill the Hamas commander. By the way, was he killed? I can't confirm yet. I'll, there'll be more uh, updated. He, yes, we know that he was killed. Um, about the civilians there, we're doing everything we can to minimize. So he's saying they're doing everything they can to minimize. Um, he's talking about uh, Ibrahim Biari, whom it identified the uh, Israel's identified as Hamas's commander of the Jabalia Center Battalion, uh, saying that he was killed um, in those recent strikes. Can you respond to every aspect of what he said? They were trying to get a high-value target, as they put it, and um, and they are not trying to kill civilians. Well, I think what's important uh, in that interview is that is another of many indications of intent on the part of Israeli authorities that will be very important in a court of law. He has said very openly that they knew of the concentrations of civilians there, and yet, in violation of the principle of distinction in international humanitarian law, and on the pretext of uh, killing one uh, combatant, uh, wiped out the better part of an entire refugee camp, densely populated. Um, refugee camp. And I think what's been interesting in this war is the very open statement of intents. I referred in my letter to the case for genocide, uh, which is happening now. And you know, genocide is a very politicized term, often abused. But in this case, the hardest part uh, of proving genocide has been proven for us with these very open statements of genocidal intent by Israeli officials, including the prime minister and the president and senior uh, cabinet ministers and military officials, who in their public statements have indicated very clearly uh, uh, their intention not to distinguish between civilians and combatants uh, and to carry out the kinds of wholesale slaughter that we are witnessing 
um, in Gaza. That, that is not a justification in international law, saying that there was a combatant there uh, for that very disproportionate use of firepower against what was a civilian target. And that's what we've been seeing in all of Gaza, from the north to uh, the south. The other thing is this claim that, well, we told them to move south, and therefore we can kill everybody who didn't move. This is an extremely dangerous and unlawful uh, uh, tactic that is being used. First, because we know that um, evacuations in Gaza, in the best of times, in this densely populated small territory uh, with 2.3 million civilians uh, crowded in with very limited infrastructure is a huge challenge. But most of Gaza has been bombed into rubble. It is just not physically possible for civilians to move en masse uh, in the ways that uh, Israel has required them to do so. And we know, already well documented, that when they do so, they're still subjected to bombings even in the south of the Gaza Strip. So all of this, it seems to me, is evidence of intent uh, and a prima facie case for violations of the war laws of war. Israel has called for U.N. Secretary General Antonio Guterres to resign after he said Hamas's October 7th attack did not happen in a vacuum. This is Israel's U.N. Ambassador Gilad Erdan. Mr. Secretary General, the U.N. was established to prevent atrocities, to prevent such atrocities, like the barbaric atrocities that Hamas committed. But the U.N. is failing. The U.N. is failing, and you, Mr. Secretary General, have lost all morality and impartiality. Because when you say those terrible words that these heinous attacks did not happen in a vacuum, you are tolerating terrorism. And by tolerating ter terrorism, you are justif justifying terrorism. That's Israel's ambassador to the United Nations. Craig McIver, your response. Well, of course, you can imagine why uh, the ambassador would want to start the clock only in October and to ignore the decades upon decades of persecution uh, against the Palestinian people in Gaza, in the West Bank, uh, in Jerusalem, inside Israel uh, proper. But that is not the kind of assessment that leads to peace or leads to uh, an improved situation on on the ground. The secretary general was doing his job. Uh, he had condemned um, uh, the loss of civilian life in the uh, Hamas attack, and he also criticized uh, not just what uh, Israel was doing in Gaza, but all of the events that have led up to this situation. And that's what I mean by a need to break from the failed paradigm of the past. We really need to get into something that says that human beings are entitled to human rights under international law, and that the duty of the international community is to ensure protection for all uh, under the rule of law, but also accountability for perpetrators and redress for uh, victims. So uh, I, I am not surprised uh, at that statement. We've seen a lot of extreme statements from uh, that particular uh, ambassador, a lot of theater uh, as well. I don't think we should allow it to distract us to what's happening on the ground, which is the wholesale loss of life of innocent civilians in their thousands, uh, including thousands of, of children in the Gaza Strip, and the need to get to an immediate ceasefire, and then to shift into a new approach that will prevent this from happening again and again and again. I'm wondering about the role of Karim Khan, the uh, lead prosecutor of the International Criminal Court. I think he was in Rafah just a few days ago. Um, we see the world's response, or the West's response, when it came to Russia invading Ukraine uh, and occupying Ukraine. Um, it, Karim Khan, uh, very soon after, opened a whole investigation into crimes against humanity um, uh, that Putin was committing in Ukraine. Can you respond to the difference in approach to Russia and Ukraine uh, and Israel and the occupied territories? Officially, international law, the OPT, the Occupied Palestinian Territories. Well, there has been a stunning inconsistency with the rapidity with which the court was able to move and the prosecutor was able to move with regard to Ukraine and the years upon years in which it has dragged its feet with regard to Palestine. 
This is just one of many critiques of the court, including the fact that uh, it does not have a very strong record of holding northern uh, countries, Israel, uh, the United States, and others, to account for uh, their crimes under international criminal law, and yet is very anxious uh, uh, to move forward on cases in the global south. Now, that is not to condemn the court. The court is a young institution. It needs to uh, be strengthened. It needs to insulate itself from the kinds of political pressure that have led to its inaction in the case of Palestine. But our hope, ultimately, is the peaceful resolution of disputes through the use of international law. And if that's going to happen, we need a robust and fair international criminal court that doesn't provide for exceptionalism for uh, powerful countries of the North, like Israel, for example, uh, but that holds all perpetrators of international crimes uh, to account. The court has a long way to go before it's going to uh, have the reputation that will bring confidence globally uh, that it's meeting its mandate under the Rome Statute. On Monday, White House Press Secretary Corinne Jean-Pierre compared pro-Palestinian protesters to the white supremacists who took part in the deadly Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville, Virginia, in 2017. She made the comment in response to a question from Fox News's Peter Ducey. Doesn't Biden think the anti-Israel protesters in this country are extremists? What I can say is what we've been very clear about this. When it comes to anti-Semitism, there is no place. We have to make sure that we speak against it very loud uh, and, be, uh, and be very clear about that. Remember, what the president decided to, when the president decided to run for president is what he saw in Charlottesville in 2017, when we, he saw uh, neo-Nazis marching down the streets of Charlottesville uh, with vile anti-Semitic uh, just hatred. And he was very clear then, and he's very clear now. Uh, he's taken actions against this over the past two years, and he's continued to be clear. There is no place, no place for this type of vile and despite, despite this, this kind of rhetoric. So that's President Biden's spokesperson, Karine Jean-Pierre. Craig McIver, your response. Well, I think one of the most disturbing aspects of this current uh, uh, situation in the North, in countries like the U.S. and in Europe, has been this rather unprecedented crackdown on human rights defenders speaking up to defend the human rights of people in Gaza uh, during this situation. And that has come from official statements that uh, try to uh, critique in that way people who are defending human rights and to compare them with far-right uh, neo-fascist protesters, for example. I mean, it's it's an outrageous comparison to make, and it doesn't stop there. We have also seen uh, uh, very strong efforts on the part of government institutions, uh, including uh, local governments and state governments and the federal government and universities and employers and others, uh, to punish people for daring to speak up, criticizing the human rights violations that are happening, um, uh, or we're criticizing the U.S. role in, in these violations. But I think what is most hopeful, Amy, and where there is a glimmer of hope, which is, I have to say, moved me very much, it's that people are not allowing themselves to be intimidated by these tactics. We have seen massive demonstrations in all parts of the country and in Europe from people uh, many times risk, risking arrest, uh, risking uh, police beatings, uh, risking other consequences because they refuse to allow this uh, to go forward and to have the human rights claim be silenced. And I think most encouraging, we have seen, you know, just a few blocks from here, a few days ago, uh, we saw a, a large group uh, organized by Jewish Voices for Peace, uh, if not now, of Jewish protesters standing up and saying, not in our name, and taking over Grand Central Station, and in one move, stripping away the Israeli propaganda point that they are somehow acting in the defense of Jews. Jewish people are not represented by Israel. These protesters have made that perfectly clear. Uh, Israel pushes an old anti-Semitic trope that it somehow represents uh, Jewish people around the world. Not only is that not factual, but it's very dangerous, and everyone needs to know that Israel is a state that's responsible for its own crimes, uh, and that responsibility does not extend to our Jewish brothers and sisters, many of whom are standing up uh, alongside Muslim and Christian uh, and others uh, in demonstrations across this country and across Europe saying that this must end.
I wanted to get your response to a comment in The Guardian uh, by Anne Bayefsky, who directs Turo College's Institute on Human Rights and the Holocaust in New York, who accused you of overt anti-Semitism, saying you'd used you and letterhead to call for wiping Israel off the map. Craig McIver, uh, if you could respond. Well, uh, Anne Bayefsky is a well-known entity amongst human rights defenders. She has made a career of attacking anyone who dares uh, to criticize Israeli human rights violations in um, particular. Uh, I have responded to this idea of wiping Israel off the map by saying I'm not looking for uh, an end to Israel, I'm looking for an end to apartheid. And it's very telling what Anne Bayeski tweeted uh, in her attack on me. She uh, accused me of anti-Semitism, and the quote that she took from my letter to prove that was my call for equal rights for Christians, Muslims, and Jews. I had to reply to her tweet by saying that she uh, had become a parody of herself, because if calling for equal rights for Christians, Muslims, and Jews is a new form of anti-Semitism, uh, then there's no conversation to, uh, to, to, to be had. But I don't think people are falling for these smears anymore. They are almost automatic. But the point needs to be made again and again that criticism of Israeli human rights violations is not anti-Semitic, just as criticism of Saudi violations is not Islamophobic. Criticism of Myanmar violations is not anti-Buddhist. Criticism of Indian violations is not anti-Hindu. If any of those are true, then there is no international human rights framework. And if only the case of Israel is true, well, that's a racist proposition that only Palestinians can't have their human rights defended in this globe. So I don't think anyone listens too much to those kinds of smears uh, anymore. Uh, and luckily, people are speaking up louder, not lowering their voices to demand human rights in the occupied territories. So what do you go off to do, Greg, Craig McIver? I mean, you've been at the United Nations for um, decades. Uh, talk about your plans now. Today is your first day that you're not working at the U.N. Mm -hmm. Well, I intend to remain involved in the cause of international human rights, in which I've been involved um, since 1980, uh, in, in fact. There's no question um, uh, about that. I will do it under my own name, unconstrained by diplomatic protocol and the constraints of the UN. I will continue to support my colleagues. I, I don't want to leave the impression that I'm criticizing the whole UN. You know, UN humanitarian workers, UN human rights workers, the UNRWA colleagues in Gaza, dozens of whom have lost their life just in the last couple of weeks under Israeli bombs, are doing absolutely heroic work all around the world. But I want to try to influence the political side of the House to take up a more realistic and principled approach to this particular conflict, one based in international human rights, one based in international humanitarian law, and one based in achievable goals, if not in the immediate term, uh, of a paradigm based upon equality, an end to apartheid, and, as I said, equal rights for Christians, Muslims, and Jews. I wanted to get your final response to the protesters just yesterday in Washington, D.C., uh, in the Senate, repeatedly disrupting Secretary of State Antony Blinken while he was testifying before the Senate uh, on President Biden's request for $106 billion for Ukraine, Israel, and militarizing U.S.-Mexico border. Um, a group of protesters with members of Muslims for Just Futures and Detention Watch Network sitting behind Blinken held up their hands covered in fake blood. He was also interrupted by members of Code Pink, including including the former State Department official Anne Wright, who resigned over the Iraq War. This is what she said. 3,500 kids dead. Come on, I'm an Army colonel. I'm a former diplomat. I resigned on that war in Iraq that you talked about. That was a terrible thing, and what they're doing right now is supporting Israel's genocide of Gaza is a terrible thing, too. Stop the war! Cease fire! She was holding a sign as she was taken out by security ceasefire in Gaza. Craig McIver, your final comments. Well, this is where I find the most uh, hope, Amy. Uh, I have lost confidence in official institutions of government uh, after all these years in the international human rights movement. I am losing hope in international, uh, important parts of international institutions. Where there is hope, it is in civil society. It is in those uh, ordinary people here in the United States and elsewhere who are willing to stand up and demand respect for human life and for human rights. And these kinds of protests uh, in the halls of uh, Congress, uh, before the State Department, in front of the White House, in Grand Central Station, in the streets, everywhere, 
particularly with this climate that is trying to suppress critique of these current policies. Um, it's only going to come from civil society. Craig McIver, we thank you so much, international human rights lawyer.